one of the big areas that we had in the opening plenary, the key theme that was coming out there was the fact that bankers really need to think about, and certainly the financial services industry, really need to think about uh, some of the long-term effects of the decisions that they make. Well, joining us to discuss some of these issues in the opening plenary and also what were some of those headlines yesterday are two very interesting and important people at Cybos. Chris Hall here with me on my left, news editor at Cybos Issues, and Heather McKenzie is editor at the Daily News at Cybos. So thanks. You guys all had a very, very late night. What time did you put the papers to bed? Uh, for me, it was about, um, including electronic versions, we uh, closed at about 2 p.m., uh, 2 a.m. last night. 2 a.m. I'm, we're much better off. We <laughs> finished at seven. Okay, yeah. so we're glad you're still here and you're still awake. So <laughs> that's always good. Let me just uh, talk about one of the key themes that we heard in that opening plenary, and that came from Takashi Kunibe. He was the guest speaker, the honorary speaker, in fact, and he talked a lot about, uh, he was from SMBC, and he talked a lot about the fact that bankers, the financial service industry, really need to think about the long-term effects of the decisions that they make. Otherwise, things could go very wrong in years to come. So let's have a listen to what he said. Ian Leba, in his book, Every Nation for Itself, says, the most obvious near-term loser in the G0 era will be those who refuse to recognize the new reality and the need for change. In order to stay ahead of the game, we should make decisions by constantly asking ourselves, is it sustainable? Is it rational? Irrational phenomena such as the Japanese asset bubble and the US housing bubble create distortions that must be corrected sooner or later. Well, that was definitely one of the stories that were making the headlines, certainly for you, Chris, mm -hmm. in your paper, Change Now to Survive. What were some of the impressions that you had? Well, it's interesting that, um, that uh, the uh, president of uh, SNBC made a particular reference linking the, uh, eight, the Japanese uh, bubble of um, uh, a couple of decades ago with uh, what happened in uh, America more recently uh, and in his term in terms of asking is it rational is it sustainable um, clearly his take on things was that um, the uh, uh, move away from uh, from banking activities that uh, had excessive leverage ex excessive risk taking um, uh, that that kind of uh, path was uh, one that uh, is now no longer open to banks and that kind of commercial banking, uh, transaction banking, you know, arguably boring banking mm -hmm. is, uh, is really the, the, you know, the, the path for the future. And, but also kind of making quite clear that relationships are important. Relationships with uh, uh, con um, consumer um, retail customers and, and with commercial um, corporate customers being very important. And one um, a kind of a, a good ray of hope um, I, I think for the future of banking was he, he, was, he was talking about um, the extent to which kind of we're all using kind of smart devices, the amount of uh, data that can be picked up from uh, uh, fr from these technologies, both by um, uh, more kind of consumer facing uh, organizations, but also by banks to develop new financial services is, is, is a kind of array of hope for uh, kind of future revenues and future services. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that, and, and I also think the, the banks that we see here this week, the transaction banks, pride themselves on being very responsible and very long-term and having those relationships. Uh, something we reported on yesterday, uh, Satvinder Singh talking, uh, from Deutsche Bank talking about the, um, the lost decade for, for banks in, in certain areas like uh, investment banking, but actually a big opportunity for the transaction banks because uh, they seem to be very responsible and, and that they intermediate, they help commerce, they, they help uh, things to be done. So yes, certainly long-term responsibility plays very well to the, 
to the banks who are here at Cybos. Okay, well then we heard after Mr. Uh, Kunibe spoke, we heard from Yawa Shah as well, the chairman of SWIFT. He talked actually a lot about the diversity uh, of SWIFT and the fact that that is what really helped with innovation and staying ahead of the curve. Have a listen to what Mr. Shah had to say. If you ever looked at the board dynamic or you look at the management dynamic with the board and you see people from diverse backgrounds, geographies, ethnicities, coming together to solve what? A global problem. We have more in common than we are apart. Mm -hmm. Let the politicians not create us apart. Mm -hmm. Commerce is a un united factor, right? And that's what I, Gottfried, and this group does here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have more in common than we mm -hmm. have not in common. I think that was the key word. And also the fact that diversity is what's really going to help us innovate for the future and also come towards good decisions so we don't have this sort of group think. And actually, a lot of the other people that we spoke to on Cybers TV yesterday brought up this idea of new talent within the financial services industry and how that will evolve across mm -hmm. the next few years. Well, I think it's interesting that um uh, at, at one point in yesterday's uh, plenary, um, I, th I think it was Gottfried made uh, a reference to the fact that uh, SWIFT now has uh, extended ca capabilities in Singapore and uh, Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. uh, both to help um, um, kind of serve banks in the, uh, in, the in, in the region, but also to, to uh, kind of tap a, uh, a talent pool that perhaps uh, uh, Swift had not uh, uh, kind of dug in too, deep, too deeply uh, previously. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of coupled with the fact that there's now kind of Chinese and Indian uh, representation on Swift's board shows that there is, that you know, it, it continues to be very much, uh, whether you want to make parallels with the United Nations or the, uh, uh, or, or the Olympics, mm -hmm. you, know, it's, it's, you know, Swift is a, a very kind of diverse so organization. The Olympics of the financial services industry. <laughs> Um, yes, and, and I think also you could uh, bring into this the increased collaboration as well between financial institutions themselves, between SWIFT and the financial institutions, SWIFT and vendors, vendors and financial institutions, that kind of diversity, the people looking at different ways mm -hmm. of, of approaching problems and, and coming up with solutions. And you alluded to Godfrey talking about that when he was making his comments about Asia, but what he also said about Asia, the CEO of Swift, Godfrey LeBrand, was the fact that, yeah, Asia is going to give new opportunities, but it's also going to give a lot of competition, uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Competition is what keeps us on our toes to let us stay ahead of our game. Have a listen to what he had to say. One of the things that I've always found very beneficial of it is that securities is a fairly dynamic business, lots of new market infrastructures being started. It's also competitive with other suppliers out there, and I think it's forced us to be our best innovative, come up with agile services, etc. So I think one of the benefits for Swift of being here, in here is the competitive nature of it and yeah, the, the, the force upon us to come up with new offerings, adapt it, and, and innovate ourselves, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was Godfrey LeBrand there speaking yesterday at the opening plenary, the CEO of SWIFT. Some of the, your impressions on what you heard from him yesterday on that topic. Well, I, in, in terms of growth, I think that um, th there is the geographic aspect, but there's also the, um, the question that, um, that kind of SWIFT still has a, um, the, there's a perspective on, on SWIFT that it's very much kind of payments focused. I think uh, Yawa made the, uh, the point that actually half of uh, SWIFT track is actually securities Security. based these days, but there's still um, quite you know quite a, quite a long way to, to go for uh, for Swift in, in in that respect. And I think the the kind of uh, regulatory change in the uh, securities and derivatives world uh, create opportunities um, and new infrastructures. Whether that's kind of T2S or the uh, the need for trade repositories, all provide an opportunity. But there's a lot of competition there. It's not home territory for a Swift in the way that uh, payments is, so they have to fight harder. But it also means that you know that they have to come up with more innovative solutions, which is uh, is you know a, a, str a strong push for uh, Swift at the moment. When you see the kind of uh, inner tribe sessions and uh, other kind of technology-based sessions at uh, Cybos this year. Mm -hmm. When we launched the Cybos Daily News 20 years ago, Swift had just allowed. Uh, fund managers onto the network and I think we asked at the time whether it was too little or too late 
because that's what you do <laughs> in uh, newspapers. But uh, it certainly has been a long time evolving. But I think today as well, they're going to announce the thousandth corporate user on, on Swift. So Swift is extending its, its membership. As Chris says, it used to be seen as a, a payments uh, organization. Also used to be seen as very European as well. And these things take time to build, obviously. But uh, the, the kind of innovating and without, I guess, going into the territory of, of uh, becoming competitive to your members, which is a theme that's come up every now and then as well, people sort of telling Swift to stick to their knitting and that sort of thing yeah. um, is, is what's needed. Okay, great, so let's move on a little bit from the opening plenary and look at some of the other things that were making headlines yesterday. And Chris, you brought in this story, uh, and I chatted with Mamohan Singh yesterday from mm. the IMF as well. You sat in uh, that Swift Institute colloquium when they were talking about whether uh, CCPs were actually going to make the OTC derivative market a lot safer, or are we just uh, essentially moving that risk downstream? Mm. Well, I think this was uh, a theme that was covered in a, a number of sessions. There was uh, uh, two um, uh, securities market infrastructure forums um, that were kind of um, that were uh, moderated by uh, my colleague uh, Dominic Hobson of uh, Global Custodian, and they, they, they covered very similar ground to uh, the uh, Swift colloquium. Um, and you know, the, the question is, are, are the reforms to reduce systemic risk in the OTC derivatives market? Are they shifting risk or are they eliminating it? Um, and the jury is very much still out. The, I, I think although we might feel that there's been a kind of uh, uh, a, a, a vast amount of regulation over the last couple of years, there was an, a, a feeling that we're really not through that yet, that there's not a, a, a resolution regime for, uh, for the post-trade uh, and certainly not for uh, uh, CCPs that are being asked to take on risks that previously they, they simply uh, weren't taking on. Mm -hmm. And, and, and until, that, uh, until that happens, then we haven't really resolved the issue of, uh, of risk in the uh, derivatives market. And we're starting to see this with a lot of players. I mean, in the FT, uh, yesterday we had the Chinese, this idea of regulation arbitrage, you know, the Chinese moving uh, from London into Luxembourg. We had a lot of this kind of uh, worry about the fact that that yes, we're not actually that much safer, so that's something we need to think about. What is your view on what we've heard so far? On risk and regulation, it's, there's tension between the regulators and the financial institutions. You, financial institutions will say that they'll work with the regulators and they, and they want to lobby and uh, it's very important to them to, to have a, a voice at the regulators um, on global and, and local levels, but uh, I think the regulators are very determined to ensure that you know you don't have a, an, another crisis, mm -hmm. which is very difficult, obviously, to do. But um, I, yeah, I think the issue of, of the OTC clearing risk is that the unintended consequences people are always concerned about, and whether there's a bit of politics in that or, or whether the, it's true, it's, it's kind yeah. of hard to say, a bit early to say. Okay, well let's look at uh, your paper, Heather, because uh, you've got a story on the front page about JP Morgan. Uh, JP Morgan's $500 million investment focuses on Asia Pacific. Tell us about why you chose this for your front story. Um, this is a follow-up to um, JP Morgan in 2008 at Vienna. Um, obviously, uh, kind of rather poorly timed given what happened, but uh, <laughs> they announced a $1 billion investment in treasury services, um, again with a bit of a focus on Asia Pacific, but uh, I quite like the story because it, uh, it kind of indicated the commitment that some of the very big banks mm -hmm. are taking towards the, the uh, transaction banking area, that, that they're prepared to invest and, and prepared to invest a lot of money. Um, Jamie Dimon, uh, chairman of JP Morgan has been in Asia. Obviously Asia is a big focus as well. Um, and uh, so that, that story was, uh, was kind of indicated what from, in, from terms of uh, the SWIFT member banks, what they're focusing on and the levels of investment that really need to be made 
to be competitive and, and to, to be global. Mm -hmm. If that's what you choose to do, okay. that's what you need. All right, thanks so much for joining us, both of you. You can go and now have a really big cup of coffee because I can't believe 2 a.m. putting those papers together, you're still <laughs> here and awake talking about OTC derivatives and a whole host of other interesting things that we had from yesterday on Cybers Day One. Thank you very much. Thanks.